So after about my second month in Tambo, I come out to drink my one cup of ayahuasca to clear out my spirit for my third tree medicine. And when I am out of Tambo in a ceremony, there's a person there um, that shows up that I just kind of make small talk with. Um, there's a backstory about him, but it's not that big of a deal. But I realized, you know, he was a person He's um, who, after I had a couple of my insights with Wyatt Cosby and Ayuma, I needed someone who, when they would leave, I would still be in Tombo, they could send a message out for me, um, send an email out for me, because I was writing a series of communications in longhand. I was just handwriting notes and I would have people type them up and email them for me uh, while I was still in Tombo. I basically meet this guy in passing and I was like, oh, okay, this person could probably send some communications out for me at a later date. So in Tombo, I sent a handwritten note to him and I had, you know, one of the workers deliver to him and I just said, can you email, like type an email for me when you leave. Um, he comes out for about 10 minutes to talk to me. And um, this was after I had my one ceremony, I talked to him. I go back in time, well, and this is probably like five days later or whatever. So since that point, he had a couple more ceremonies while I was just in Tombo. And I finally made the decision that I needed somebody to send some communications out for me, and I asked him. Um, this person, he says to me, he goes, uh, so Daniel, I, <laughs> um, I've been reading this book and it's called The Raw Material or The Law of One. I was like, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> what is it? And he's like, oh, it's a book that's about, um, this group of people who channel this extraterrestrial entity called Ra. He goes, I think you should read it. I think you, it would do you an enormous amount of good. Or maybe you should just read it but not read it in Tombow because maybe Tombow might, you know, it might interfere with your Tombow process, but I think you should read it. You know, reading about channeling extraterrestrials wasn't on my, on the top of my to-do list. But he brought something else up. He goes, I, um, he said, he goes, so I spoke to this, entity, this extraterrestrial entity Ra in ceremony last night. And I asked him what you were. <laughs> and I said, why would you bring me up in ceremony, you know? I was just kind of curious because we're essentially strangers. And he's like, yeah, I just wanted to ask. And he said that Ra told him that I was a wanderer. And I was like, okay, what's a wanderer? And he says, a wanderer is somebody who has reached a level of ascension. Um, what he achieved, what he referred to as achieved a higher density. He goes, uh, so you're somebody who has achieved a higher density or reached a level of ascension, <clears throat> but you reincarnate back to this, you know, level of uh, experience. You come back as a mortal, even though you reach ascension, and you come back to do it all over again to kind of teach others and help others on their way to ascension. And I said, oh, that's interesting. It sound, sounds like it probably fits the <coughs> uh, personality profile of me, and especially what I've kind of been doing with ayahuasca and also what I've been doing with this Tieta specifically. It seems to make sense. Okay. You know, it sounds kind of interesting. Maybe I will <laughs> read it when I get the time, but I don't think I want to do it right now in town. I'm still figuring out, I'm still figuring out the intricacies of this whole thing about DNA as a wave and also kind of DNA viewing or retrieving information from your DNA at a higher dimension. Um, so it wasn't on my radar. I had, I was still figuring out these little pieces still. These didn't show up. Um, towards maybe the <clears throat> midpoint of my third tree medicine.
This is all before I get my prayer in Tombo. I get my prayer in Tombo. And that's when I realized that I need this person to send an email out for me. So I send him another note. And I say, I'm going to send you a handwritten note that I want you to send out when you when you go you know, to the nearest Wi-Fi spot to email for me. I um, start writing this note by hand about this prayer. And I wrote it to a friend of mine because he was going through some kind of personal issues before. I even left and I realized the value of this prayer that... Um, anybody who could say it sufficiently and correctly, it could transform them. That they could have a metaphysical identification with the other, with their, you know, supposed enemy, and realize unity from that. So I wrote in this note and I said um, to my friend, I go, I received this prayer in the wilderness. And I used it to remove all hurt and anger from me. Whatever's going on in your life, I think you should say this prayer too, to whoever is causing you any harm or making you suffer. And I deconstructed the prayer form. And I realized in the deconstruction how elegant and simple this prayer was, but how powerful it was. It does a couple of things that are very kind of jujitsu. It kind of flips... Um, it flips you mentally and psychically, emotionally, without you realizing that you've been flipped. It says, you know, I pray that your suffering comes to an end. And so, even if you don't believe in prayer, you, by saying, I pray, pray becomes a verb. It's in the field of action. It means that even if you don't believe it, by saying, I pray, you are saying that you are praying. So if you already say, I pray, you don't need to know how to pray. You are praying by saying, I pray. Then you, while you are saying this, you know, I pray, whatever, you go through your own self-inquiry of what the hell prayer is to you, what prayer means to you. I don't have to tell you what prayer is. Your parents don't have to tell you. You're, you know, church or clergy or whatever doesn't tell you prayer is, you're saying to yourself, I pray, and you're figuring out for yourself what you mean by the words I pray. You know, and then I went through the all those other things I mentioned in another blog where I said, like, I pray that your suffering comes to an end. And I realized that when somebody else is suffering, because they are suffering, they in turn make those around them suffer. So when I say I pray that your suffering comes to an end, I am praying that because this person suffers, and when I pray that their suffering comes to an end, they no longer make me suffer. So when I am praying for their suffering to end, I'm praying actually for my own suffering to end, that they are one and the same. I realized a number of things from this prayer about basically disbelief. If you don't believe in prayer, and if you don't, you know, if you want to hold a grudge against those that wrong you or those that are your enemies. And that's the jujitsu trick that it did to me. I made a realization about this prayer that if you take the opposite stance, what is the end result of that? If I said to you, you know, well, one, I don't pray for your suffering to end, you know, or I pray that your suffering continues indefinitely, or I pray that you suffer, like that is wanting ill will against your neighbor. You are actually wishing for spite against somebody. Everybody should hope that everybody's suffering should come to an end. To want someone else to suffer indefinitely is slightly sadistic. It is kind of psychotic. When you say, I don't wish you to find peace in your heart, you know, what kind of a person doesn't want someone to find peace in your heart? So I realized something about this prayer. It's so simplistic and so elegant that you can put it 
at the end of anything, I realize that you can put this prayer itself at the end of any other prayer of any other religion system, any other like sutra, cone, any other, you know, quote from any other piece of wisdom literature. So you can put it at the end of like the Torah, the Quran, the Old or New Testament. You could put it at the end of anything in the Bhagavad Gita, whatever. You could put it at the end of anything and it will fit perfectly to whatever person's religious beliefs are. They had a profound insight into this prayer. I was trying to allude to it in this letter I was writing to my friend and I also kind of mentioned it directly to this person who was going to email it for me, that you could take somebody like a Muslim in the West Bank, and you could take a, a Jewish person in the West Bank, and they could both point guns at each other, ready to kill each other with all the malice in their heart. And right before they pull the trigger to kill their supposed enemy, they could say this prayer. So they could say something from the Torah, and the other guy could say something from the Quran, but at the end they say, I pray that your suffering comes to an end, I pray that you find peace in your heart, and I pray that your spirit is protected. And if they say it sufficiently a number of times, and they say it correctly, they'll both drop their guns. I don't think you can have anybody who, no matter what their belief system, with whatever anger or violence they have inside them, when they start saying this prayer, if they say it correctly, they can't avoid but dropping their weapons, dropping their anger, dropping their hatred, dropping their violence. You can say it cynically, you can say it with malice, you can say it with anger, but like, you can say it pissed off, you can say it pray that your suffering comes to an end, you know? <laughs> and the absurdity of your anger will make you realize that you have to change your approach to this prayer. You will transform inside until you say it sincerely. And when the minute you say it sincerely, for anybody, it's the minute you drop your hatred and you drop your weapon. Like when you, once you say the prayer sincerely, you are ultimately praying to end another person's suffering. And by extension, end your own. You are ending your own suffering through praying to end somebody else's suffering. So that when you pray to end somebody else's suffering, because you actually like even pray to end somebody else's suffering, your suffering ceases in that moment. Your suffering ceases in the moment that you actually pray to end somebody else's suffering. And nobody can harm you after that. Because no matter what somebody else reacts, the more somebody even can project malice or anger, hatred, violence towards you, the more you say this prayer. Every time somebody does something to wrong you, your response is, I pray that your suffering comes to an end. I pray that you find peace in your heart. I pray that your spirit is protected. And it just kind of is this thing that flips the anger, flips the malice, flips the pain, flips the suffering into peace and love. I realized you can get everybody who has any kind of philosophical difference to say this sufficiently to whoever it is that is giving them <laughs> their suffering, their strife, whatever it is in the world, and it will cease. It will just cease. And so I wrote to the best of my ability the kind of tenet of this, that by, you know, praying to end some suffering, you're praying to end your own, and by praying to end your own suffering, your suffering ceases. And so that no matter what kind of suffering somebody inflicts on you, they can't harm you anymore. Because you've transformed their suffering into love and forgiveness. You know, I sent it through a worker to this person who's going to email it for me. The next day, I on a hike, you know, because I was hiking by myself every now and then in Tambo, and this person saw me hiking, so he kind of followed me. 
even though you know you're not supposed to communicate with many people in Tombo. We'd go hiking uh, for a little bit, and he goes, "Oh, you know what? I um, I got done typing your note for you." He actually typed it manually on his cell phone with his thumbs that night, which was I thought was just absurd. I thought he could wait till he can get to a proper keyboard and do it, but he just did it that night. And he goes, "Oh, Daniel, I want to tell you something." And he goes, "I go, yeah." And he goes, "That prayer that you sent to your friend." And your explanation of the prayer, he goes, that's the essence of the raw material. That is the law of one. I'm going to go, you got to be shitting me. He goes, no, I'm not shitting you. He goes, you know the essence of the raw material without ever reading the book. I go, that's fucking crazy. He goes, you are a wanderer. <laughs> and I go, I guess I am. I don't think you need to tell a wanderer that they're a wanderer because they are a wanderer. You know, right now it's hard to see how the dots connect in a story like that to this whole thing with ayahuasca, with the aid of the secrets of the universe, but there's a deeper message here that goes even beyond ayahuasca that I'm going to end up sharing with you at the very, very end. I just want you to keep this in the back of your thoughts um, while the rest of this story is going on, because besides having some incredibly fucked up ceremonies, there's some things that happen on the um, material plane in this kind of waking state that just get really fucked up. And the more fucked up these things get, the more I find myself on my knees in prayer. And the more I realize that that prayer and that time in Tambo is more important than anything else that I did with Diego.